Hello, here's another video of me talking about making music without actually making music. Welcome to another fireside chat. So the topic today is the Minilog XD. And I've had this synth for quite a while now. Um, I've, this was basically the first synth uh, that I bought. Uh, so previously I had borrowed a Volca Keys for a while and that was kind of technically my first synth. Um, but in terms of what I purchased, it was the XD and that was very much uh, you know, informed by the, the Volca keys being, uh, being of similar nature. So, um, when I was getting into synthesis, um, you know, I understood like most people do that subtractive synthesis was kind of the easiest way to start. And that's what led me towards the mini log. And then, um, as I looked into kind of the, the features, um, I decided that the mini log XD was worth the upgrade from the original mini log. And it has been a very formative synth for me. Like definitely it's what got me hooked into all of this. Um, and if it weren't for this synth, uh, I probably wouldn't be making these videos today. So definitely it holds a, a special place in my heart. Um, this is, you know, the actual original one I bought. Um, more recently, I also picked up the module version. So same synth, just without the keyboard. And I'll just call this, you know, XD module versus XD keys with the keyboard. And um, so I have both now. And why would I bother to buy a second? Well, the reason uh, is that I wanted to expand it to eight voices. And so the synths have the ability to uh, do what they call polychain, where you take a MIDI cable out from one, put it into the other. And um, it's, a, it's a type of a MIDI overflow mode where when you send notes to one of the synths, as soon as you've used up all four of the voices, um, the notes, you know, five, six, seven, and eight get sent over to the second synth in the polychain. And uh, so basically it goes from being a four voice polyphonic synth to becoming an eight voice polyphonic synth. Um, and that's pretty cool. So that's why I bought two of them. Um, the prices had also come down a fair bit by the time I bought the module one. Um, so, you know, I, I felt like this is a pretty good value. And, um, I will say the kind of in retrospect, um, I think I probably would have been better off buying the module from the beginning. Uh, a couple of reasons for that. One, on the keys version here, the, the keyboard quality, uh, it's fine, but it's not amazing. Um, you know, they, they feel good, but it's synth action keys and um, they are velocity sensitive, but there's no aftertouch. There's kind of nothing fancy about them. They're just a pretty standard keyboard. Um, if you've played the key step, uh, the keyboard feels pretty comparable to me between the XD here and the key step, um, but the key step has aftertouch, so it's a little bit better in that sense. Um, so it's like, it's comfortable to play, but frankly, there's just not enough keys. It's not wide enough. Um, I come from a piano background. I like playing with two hands. And this keyboard, what, what I think it's really great for is playing with one hand while tweaking the knobs with the other hand. Um, which for a sound design workflow makes a lot of sense. You want to be just playing simple stuff to kind of hear it make sounds while you're tweaking knobs and, and diving into whatever it is you're trying to design. So if you're buying the Minilog XD uh, primarily as a sound design synth, I think the keys version makes a lot of sense for that. Um, but if you already have a keyboard you like, uh, some MIDI controller, um, then definitely I would say get the module version instead. And I will also say, you know, it seemed like kind of a gimmick, but they have this little switch here where you can use the, the 16 buttons here across the bottom as like a rudimentary keyboard um, if you don't have anything else attached. And it's not that bad. I mean, it's, it's definitely not as good as a real keyboard, but it's totally usable, um, especially again from that sound design perspective where you just want to hear it make some sound so that you can then tweak it. You know, holding down a chord on three or four of these little buttons, it's not, I mean, it's fine. Um, so. I, I really like the, the module version better, and that would be my recommendation for pretty much anybody. Um, I have to also mention kind of the, the little sibling of the Minilog XD, which is the Korg NTS-1. Uh, I should do a whole other video just on the NTS-1 because I love this thing so much. Um, but basically this is kind of a, you can think of it as the micro version, but it's also, um, it also shares some DNA with the, the Monotron delay and the Monotron Duo, I think, like the old Monotrons. Um, so it, it kind of has its own little history. Um, but basically what it is in, in relation to the Minilog XD is it is a single one of the digital oscillators in a box. 
So that means you can use it as a monophonic synth voice, um, and you can also use it as an effects box to process audio in running through the Logue SDK effects. And that's really, really powerful. And that's something that um, the Minilog XD cannot do. And that's, that's a real shame, honestly. There's no audio input on this. So all of the digital effects in this section here, you can apply to its own sounds, its own oscillators, but you can't route anything else through it. And that's a shame. I mean, I, it's like the NTS-1 has so much value for me because I can add those excellent effects to other synths um, that, that don't have them. And also I even use, I have two of the NTS-1 so that I can have two different parallel effects chains or I can use one as a synth and one for effects. And like I will use the NTS-1 for master effects on everything that, I, that I'm doing. Like I will use it on the um, effects send of my mixer. And it's just great for that. And I really wish that the XD could do that also. Even if it could only take, you know, a mono input or whatever, I don't care. If it could just have some sort of audio input to process external audio through its effects, I think that would be a huge benefit here. Um, I will also mention the kind of bigger version, the, the Prologue. And there's both 8 voice and 16 voice versions of the Prologue. And um, I've never used them, so I can't comment too thoroughly on that. I know at the time that I was shopping for this, I kind of chatted with some people online about it. And there were like some firmware problems and bugs with the prologue. Um, I assume that's all been fixed by now because that was over a year ago, uh, probably two years ago. So I assume it's fine now. Um, and if you are, if your goal is to buy an eight voice poly synth, um, I would say the prologue eight voice version makes way more sense than buying two mini log XDs and polychaining them the way that I did. The reason being, when I went for the polychain thing, I was thinking like, okay, I'll have double the interface, you know, double the amount of knobs and all that. I should have like more fine tuned control, double the controls or whatever. Um, no, no, unfortunately it doesn't work that way. The way it works is one of them uh, kind of is in master mode. You do everything through that interface, whichever one you choose, you do everything through that interface. And the other one, all of the controls are disabled. Um, so it's, it's really, it's just, it's a voice expander um, but it doesn't actually give you any direct control over those voices. They're all, they're all controlled by the main one. And the more I think about it, you know, that makes sense, especially for something like the filter. Like, yeah, of course, you want the filter to be running. Uh, you know, you, t you want to turn one knob and have that affect the whole eight voice synth at once, right? So it does make sense. Um, but I do think there was maybe some room to innovate something like even if you could just use the second control interface as a MIDI controller for some other external synth that didn't have one you know that would be cool it's just it's kind of a waste of your desktop real estate to have this whole big massive synth especially this size where literally all of the controls are disabled and you can't do anything with them so when I'm doing the polychain thing um, I've got this big synth just tucked away off on a shelf I'm running power to it I'm running a MIDI cable and I'm running audio out from it and that's it. It's literally like faced away from me where I can't touch anything because there's nothing you can do on it. So there's kind of no point. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for an eight voice synth, um, the, the prologue eight voice is probably going to make more sense. You know, that said, if you're really tight on space and you just don't want the big keyboard version, getting two of these modules and having one tucked away on a shelf, like I mentioned, it is very compact. So, you know, that it's an option to consider. The other thing that's really disappointing about Polychain here is that, um, the way they've implemented it, so when you turn, well, okay, I should say, the knobs work um, as you'd expect in the sense of, you know, you turn one and it affects both simultaneously, and that's good. Um, but when it comes to all the memory patch slots, so that includes, um, you know, choosing whatever preset or init patch slot or whatever you're using, and also um, the slots for all the effects and the user oscillators, um, it, it, they, don't, they don't sync in a way that's logical to me. So what you have, basically what, what you do is on the master one, you are telling the secondary one, hey, change to memory slot number three, or change to memory slot number seven, or whatever it is that you're telling it to do. And the second one is gonna change to that memory slot, but it has no knowledge of saying, well, hey, wait a minute, this one has this user oscillator A, and my secondary synth has user oscillator B in it, and these don't, these aren't the same. It's not going to work. So 
unless you're very careful and like go through and actually fully wipe one, you have to make a full kind of duplicate copy of one synth into the secondary synth. So whichever one you want to be your master, you need to go into the librarian software, you need to, um, every, every single effect and every single um, uh, user oscillator you have in there, you have to, and uh, every preset patch also, you have to fully export them into like a backup file and then go into your secondary synth and import them there so that they are perfect mirror copies, right? And then in the future, anytime you want to try out some new effects or some new oscillators or whatever, um, you're going to have to repeat that process again. Or even anytime you like create a new patch, well, I'm not sure about the patches. The patches might get saved on both, but at least in terms of the log SDK stuff, um, you're going to have to do that every time. And that means hooking both of them up to a computer one at a time, because you can't, you can't use the library and software with both simultaneously. So it's just a hassle. It's a pain. It's not like you could have it set up in a way where, it, where it's like you set it up once and you're just happy with that forever. But that's kind of not the point of the synth. The point of the synth is with the whole digital side of it, it lets you change it over time. It lets the synth evolve with you because you can load new software on there to give it new capabilities. And so I feel like Korg didn't really think that one through. Um, to me, after having tried to use the polychain functionality for a while, like it feels very much like this kind of 11th hour uh, afterthought that they threw on there. They're like, oh, it could do that. Why don't we just make it do that also? But they didn't really you know, think through the workflow of how a musician is going to actually use that in practice. And so that's kind of my... Uh, advice around polychain is it's not really worth it. You're going to be better off with either the Prolog 8 voice or some other synth, you know, that, that just is already eight voices. Um, so, uh, kind of jumped way ahead of myself. Um, that's all right. Um, the, the other, I'd say, kind of big limitation I want to mention, which, you know, should be obvious just looking at the specs, is that it's, it's uh, only four voice polyphonic. Um, which, you know, compared to the Volca Keys, which is vastly cheaper, Volca Keys is three voices. This only adds one voice on top of that. It's not that much. And um, four voices I've found, again, for me, coming from a piano background, I like playing with two hands. And four voices is not enough to play with two hands because I will frequently want to play a four-note chord with my left hand and then play, like, you know, a lead line with my right hand. That's five voices I would need to do that. And... Um, so I've kind of found through practice that uh, playing the Minilog XD by itself on a bigger two-handed keyboard um, is, is disappointing because four voices just aren't quite enough. Um, so expanding it to eight voices solves that problem, but then you have all these other limitations that I just griped about. So um, I've kind of found through my practice that uh, six voices is kind of the sweet spot for me for the way I like to play. If I have a six-voice six voice polyphonic synth I'm happy I don't really run into um, voice limitations there um, so anything six plus uh, feels right to me and um, eight voices uh, tends to be a more common one and so that's kind of what I'd recommend if you if you want to be able to play in a piano style with two hands uh, six to eight voices or more uh, is gonna be good for that so what else do I want to say about it um, a little joystick here I think the joystick's really great, um, and I definitely use it. Uh, the main issue I have with it is that the horizontal, um, the horizontal axis is hard coded as pitch bend, and whereas the the y axis, the vertical, is um, you can change it. You can set it to be whatever you want, and you can actually change the positive direction and the negative direction to be different things, um, which is very cool. And I I really wish um, I really wish you could just change what the horizontal is because uh, you know, if I'm playing this on a bigger keyboard anyway, I probably already have pitch bend on the bigger keyboard. And so I'd rather be able to remap the joystick to do something else. So the joystick, it's limited. Um, also, if you are just trying to play the Y axis, it's really easy to accidentally get a little bit of the horizontal uh, pitch bend in there when you may not want it. And so um, in that sense, too, it's kind of risky if you don't want any pitch bend. It's kind of risky to use the joystick because it's easy to get just a, a hint of it, you know. So... Um, the joystick, I think, ultimately is a positive thing, and it's, it's definitely part of kind of the character of the synth, um, but I just really wish you could remap the horizontal, and maybe, maybe in a firmware update they can change that. I don't know. Um, 
terms of the analog part of this, um, it being you know an analog synth, uh, it sounds great. Um, I think it's there's there's more interesting filters out there, but you know I I really have no gripes about this filter. Um, it's 12 dB per octave, um, and it I think it sounds good. Um, that's one of the biggest differences, I think, with the original Minilog, is that the filter is a bit different. It just has a different sound character to it. Um, but I think, I think they both sound good. This one I would describe as, um, just kind of smooth. It's like, it doesn't, uh, doesn't have a ton of, like, grit or character to it. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but if you want something that's more like the MS-20 style filter, this is not that. So, um, anyway, the, the whole analog section... I'm very happy with um, the digital section though is really what makes this synth special so the multi-engine um, you know means that it can function as oscillators and as effects simultaneously and um, so you can run one user oscillator and um, up to three different effects of the different effects categories which are modulation reverb and delay uh, you can stack all of that simultaneously and the the user oscillators on this okay well the built-in oscillators um, like noise generator and then different digital ones like they're all fine they're good I have no no issues with them but I don't really use them that much because the user oscillators are just so special and there's so many cool ones out there um, and they they all take a bit of time to like really get into I mean you can load up some user oscillators and just play around and have fun and that's not an issue but to really learn like how deep some of them go, um, it takes it takes a while. And um, that's kind of up to the um, you know whoever designed them, the programmer, um, how how much depth or uh, capability they gave you in that oscillator. And so each one's going to be a bit different, and each one's going to have its own kind of philosophy based on the designer, right? And um, there's the the biggest, I think, issue um, with user oscillators is uh, so this shape knob of course is very important in all of them that's going to be the primary uh, sound shaping tool that you have for any of the user oscillators is the shape knob now there's another very important uh, parameter which is shift shape meaning you hold the shift key and turn the shape knob and the way that's physically laid out on here you need two hands to do that which means you cannot be playing the keyboard while doing a shift shape uh, change and that's very disappointing because with a lot of these oscillators the kind of interplay between whatever you parameter you're controlling with shape and whatever parameter you're controlling with shift shape is really fun and great and um, in some of these user oscillators like that's the primary thing that's what you want to be controlling most of the time and so the fact that first of all there's no way to change those two things simultaneously because they use the same knob and secondly you need two hands to use the shift shape one. Both of those, I think, are just kind of bad UI, in my, in my opinion. Um, now, that said, that can be solved with a MIDI controller. You can map shift shape out to uh, you know, a separate knob or fader or whatever on a MIDI controller, and that works fine. And that's, that's the solution that I've adopted. So on uh, my main MIDI controllers, I just have one knob mapped to shape, one knob, one knob mapped to shift shape, and then I can do both of them simultaneously. And of course, you can also sequence that as well. Um, and yeah, let's talk about the sequencer a bit. So I think that's the other primary uh, negative I have to say about the Minilog XD is the sequencer. It's um, it's bizarre because it's deep, and yet it's also very shallow. So it's shallow in that it has a maximum length of 16 steps, like period. You you can't go longer, and um, there are kind of the workarounds where you change the scale so that instead of uh, sequencing 16th notes, you're sequencing eighth notes or quarter notes or whatever. Um, so you can lose step resolution and make it sound like you have a longer sequence. But that's a significant trade-off. Um, and furthermore, there's no pattern chaining. Um, and so that means, you know, you're just stuck with 16 steps no matter what, basically. And um, that's, to me, that just makes the sequencer basically unusable, um, unfortunately, because it has a lot of depth in terms of the modulation options, um, the way that you can um, 
the way that you can lock different, uh, like in the electron workflow, they call it parameter locks or p-locks. Basically that same kind of thing is possible here where you can lock different knob positions to different steps. Um, and then you also have the four lanes of motion recording if you want to like be live tweaking a knob and recording that to have kind of a smooth gradual change over time, you can do that too, up to four different knobs or parameters simultaneously. All that is really great. It's a, it's a great depth of sequencer, but 16 steps is just kind of useless outside of very certain genres of music. I mean, if you're just making techno, that's great. That's all you need. But for pretty much anything else, you need more than 16 steps. So that means to me that the um, I, tr I tried for a long time to just make music with the internal sequencer here, and I just gave up after a while. Um, and so I invested in external sequencers so I could use a different sequencer to send the MIDI notes and send the sequences and do pattern chaining and all this other stuff I wanted to do. I ended up going with both Novation and Electron. I think they both make great sequencers, and I've used both of them to control the MIDI Log XD, and I'd recommend either, whichever suits your style, and I have huge videos on that. But um, yeah, the it's just a head scratcher to me, like why they would they would um, limit the sequencer so much. Um, and again, it's one of these things where it's like, I, I don't understand how, how they're, they're not thinking through how a musician's actually going to use this. Now, that said, um, the Korg sequencer is roughly the same on all of the Volcas. And, um, you know, I think on even some of the higher end stuff, like the Prologue, I think has the same sequencer. Um, and so that's just, that's just Korg style, I guess. They now have the their 64-step dedicated sequencer, which I've never used, but I've heard is very good. So hopefully that kind of, you know, 64-step sequencer DNA starts working its way into their synth directly. Um, but for me, for my workflow, it's just meant that the sequencer in basically every Korg device I've used um, is kind of useless, and I end up using them purely as sound sources, as sound modules, um, and then I sequence them from external gear. So um, the other big limitation, um, there's only one LFO, and it's just global. You can tell the LFO to not affect certain things. You can say, you know, affect oscillators one and two, but not the digital oscillator, stuff like that. Um, so you can exclude things from the LFO, which is good. Um, but uh, you only have three different LFO targets, uh, pitch, shape, and cutoff. Those are the only three things you can send the LFO to, which is pretty limiting. And um, there's only one. So um, as I've gotten further into kind of my journey with synthesis, I found that having multiple LFOs, at least two, is really great. Um, and it's, it's definitely something I miss on the Minilog XD. Now, I think that was a very conscious choice from Korg, actually, was to, uh, by only having one LFO and limiting the, the destination sources or the destinations for that, um, they're simplifying the synth a lot. And I think that really was kind of the, the goal in the design of this one is like, this is a, a starter or kind of a beginner synth that has enough depth to like make you not just immediately outgrow it, but also enough limitations to keep it simple and keep it approachable. And in terms of it being kind of one knob per function and everything is labeled well, everything does what you'd expect it to do, it's really great for that. And, um, you know, the, the overall kind of size and shape and layout, it feels very comfortable to play. The distance between the knobs is great. You know, you're not like in there, like on the Volcas, it can be like the Volca keys, for example, specifically. <laughs> it's, you know, the knobs are just tiny and they're in this tiny little grid and it's like, it can be hard to physically get your fingers in there and like tweak them without bumping the one next to it. This does not have that problem. The knobs feel great. Um, the little switches feel great. Uh, build quality is really good. Um, another con I'll mention, I don't know how big a deal this is going to be for most people, but the outputs are unbalanced, um, which basically what that means is if you're using this in the studio and you have relatively short cables going from this to your mixer or your interface, that's not a problem at all. But if, um, if you're intending to play with this in a live setting and, you know, you may have very long cables going from your, all your instruments into, you know, some mixer that's far away, uh, that can be a problem and you can definitely get noise in unbalanced outputs. And so this again, being more of the kind of entry level 
synth, I think that's it makes sense that they did that, but it would have been nice to see uh, balanced outputs on there. Um, I already mentioned the lack of audio in for me is a big downside, but you know, um, the whole CV side of it, I haven't used it all, so I can't really comment. I think um, it's pretty cool that they included that. If you are into modular stuff, I'm sure that's exciting. Um, the fact that it has the, the Korg or the Volca sync style also is super convenient because a lot of people like me are going to go from having Volcas and kind of upgrade to the mini log and being able to just quickly sync it with all your um, other audio pulse sync stuff is wonderful. And, um, and I will say like, it just, you know, I, I love MIDI, <laughs> but um, this audio pulse sync style is so simple. You plug things in and they just work. And that's really nice, especially at the kind of, you know, the more um, entry level side of these things. So, uh, so it does that well. It does, it does MIDI pretty well. Um, I will say there's the major limitation in terms of MIDI is that there's no MIDI through and also there's no MIDI out slash through. Um, so it has MIDI in, has MIDI out, and that's it. And um, that's, that's annoying because it means that if you have a table with a bunch of different stuff, you're trying to route it all together, you're probably going to need to get a MIDI splitter or some other box dedicated to that. You can't make a MIDI daisy chain through this synth. Um, yeah, which is annoying. And um, the MIDI out port, uh, like you can configure this to be a MIDI controller for something else, but... I don't really understand why you would. Um, there's better MIDI controllers out there, you know. So um, the MIDI out function of this, all that's really useful to send out from there is MIDI clock if you want this to be your master clock. But other than that, it's it, there's not much point to it. So if it had a MIDI through, or if you could like toggle the function of this MIDI out port to function as a MIDI through, that would be super useful. And I would actually use that in my setup. Um, but as it is, you know, I use MIDI in uh, to sequence it from external gear, but I don't use MIDI out at all. Um, well, I do use MIDI out if I'm doing the polychain thing, because that's how that works. But um, USB MIDI, I don't use in my setup, but does it fine. Um, and, you know, the fact that it's separate power supply from USB MIDI means that um, you're not going to have the ground loop issues that a lot of USB powered synths have. So I think that's definitely a positive. Um, speaking of power, you can easily power the Minilog XD from the nine volts uh, ripcord and a USB battery. And so this actually can be a pretty decent little portable synth, um, a battery powered synth. Now that said, um, the portability on this, I'm gonna put that in the con category also. It's um, in making it kind of like this luxurious wide layout, that means it's not very compact. And you know, it's also, pretty heavy, like it's solidly built, you know, with wood and metal and plastic. And um, so I'd say this is not a terribly portable synth. Like gigable, you know, to take it somewhere to play live. Yeah, absolutely you can, but you're, it's only if you're gonna be schlepping a bunch of stuff anyway. But you know, are you gonna take this to the cafe to mess around on while sipping your coffee? Probably not, it's not that level of portability. So yeah, portability, not so much. Um, I will say the, a bit of praise for the keys version is like, taking this uh, and just go sitting at my kitchen table uh, with a little USB battery and headphones just to have like a dedicated sound design session uh, just for creating patches and not worrying about creating music necessarily. I do actually really like it for that. And it's nice, you know, to have it all be all in one. I don't have to worry about hooking up a keyboard. But that said, again, if I was only going to buy one, I'd buy this one and I'd buy, you know, the Keystep 37 or some kind of basic MIDI keyboard like that to pair with it. And it's, it's just going to be a better setup, um, especially since something like the Keystep has a built-in sequencer. If you like that sequencer, it's going to be better than this internal one. Um, so, you know, I, ultimately, I think an external MIDI keyboard, external um, MIDI sequencer is uh, highly recommended. I mean, I would, I would argue it's kind of required, um, but it's, it's just uh, you're going to have a much better experience with that, I think. Um, because of all the limitations I already mentioned about this sequencer. So something else I want to mention, um, I'm sure there's some of you out there that already have the original mini log, uh, the mini log OG, we all call it now. And um, you're thinking, well, is it worth it for me to upgrade to the mini log XD? And well, the answer is that is two part. One, there is a bit of a sound difference between them. Like I mentioned, I think the filters sound a bit different. The oscillators, I think they sound pretty much the same. 
Um, but you know, there, there is a certain kind of quality to the Mini Logo G. It sounds great. They both sound great. So I don't think there's one that's better than the other. That's just a personal preference thing. Um, two, the, the other big side of course is the whole digital aspect of the XD and that whole digital aspect is right here in the NTS one. Now on the XD, you have, um, you have two voices, uh, digitally, whereas here you only have one. So in terms of it being a synth, um, you would have to have two of the NTS one to get that same kind of effect. But, um, really though, I'd say, don't worry about that. The thing you want is the effects, the effects on the mini log XD, the stock ones that come with it are good, but the log SDK ones that you can download and add on are excellent. There's so many good ones out there. Um, a lot of them are free. Some of them cost money, but it's usually like 20 to 30 bucks. It's not a crazy amount of money. Um, and they're really, really, really fantastic. And so if you just want to add that to your original mini log or any other synth, get the NTS one, the NTS one, you know, it's a hundred bucks. Like it's, it's unbeatable. I think this thing really deserves a spot in pretty much everybody's studio. It's so good. Um, the build quality is absolute crap. <laughs> it's, um, it's meant to be this DIY kit, which, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't teach you anything. You just put it together like Legos, but, um, but, uh, the, basically the, por the problem is that the, um, mini jack or eighth inch, uh, 3.5 millimeter jacks on this all over it. Um, they're soldered directly to the board. There's no physical reinforcement there. And so they break over time. Um, but Korg will just replace this under warranty. Um, so if yours break, uh, mine did, I had on my original one, my audio output one broke, it fractured such that, you know, you had to hold the cable just a certain way to get the sound and, um, and Korg just replaced it under warranty, no problem. So, um, that's, you know, it's a heads up with this. Like these I'd say are not terribly, like they're extremely portable. They're super tiny and lightweight. They're not terribly gigable because they're not necessarily reliable, um, in, uh, in a setting where you have to constantly set up and break down. Now, if you did want to gig with one of these, I'd say build it into a stronger enclosure and have all your cables pre-plugged in with some other little patch bay or something that lets you, you know, work on those plugs. So you don't have to touch these at all. Then it's great. Um, and I would definitely recommend it. And I've been dreaming for gosh, years now about like building this into a kind of traditional guitar pedal enclosure. Um, maybe someday I will, I'm just too busy, but other problem with this one, it is USB powered, um, micro USB, unfortunately. Um, and it does have ground loop issues, um, especially if you're using USB MIDI. So I don't, I, the way I get around that is I give this its own dedicated little battery pack. Um, so each NTS one I use, I, I can actually run both NTS ones off a single battery pack and that seems to be fine. I don't get any issues with that. Um, but I don't mix it with other synths. Um, and it's such a, a power miser. It's not a problem. You can give it the cheapest, tiniest little battery and it'll power on and run just fine. Um, and then I use the actual MIDI, uh, the 3.5 millimeter MIDI in, uh, in for sequencing. So, um, highly, highly recommend the NTS one. If you're like thinking about the mini log XD as an upgrade path, um, I would say get this first. Um, and you're because you can route other synth audio through these effects it's so so good um and I, i've even done it where i have the xd routed through this so i can double up on each of those effects that's a little overkill but you can do it and it's cool um so i would say the the built-in effects um or the the effects engine the log sdk ecosystem of effects is in my mind kind of the the number one reason to go for either the NTS one or the mini log XD, like in terms of the synth voices, um, they're definitely interesting and good. Um, but there's a lot of options out there for high quality synth voices and the analog ones in this, I think are solid, dependable, good. Um, but they're not necessarily like special, uh, the digital log SDK oscillator engines are, some of them are very special, actually. It's very much depending on the programmer, what, you know, how much effort they put into it and what they came up with, what their innovations were. Some of them are just kind of simple. Oh, here's a digital sawtooth wave. Great. Others are like, here's a full synth in this thing. <laughs> but, um, and I will, um, 
I think I'm going to do a different video specifically on all of my favorite Logue SDK stuff. That's too much to get into here, but like I will highlight some of the best stuff out there. Um, and I will mention with that, with either the NTS1 or the Mini Log XD, the Logue SDK user oscillators, they, they allow the synth to do things that it wouldn't otherwise do out of the box, right? So this is sold as an analog subtractive synth, and it is. But with this digital um, oscillator engine, it can actually do FM synthesis, um, it can do vector synthesis, uh, it can do other forms of digital synthesis, uh, which is pretty amazing that you can like add new types of synthesis to the box through free or affordable software. Um, so it's a really good investment in that sense. Um, that reminds me of another another negative or another con I want to mention. Um, this currently does not do audio over USB. It will only do audio through the traditional quarter inch uh, jacks. That is, I think, a big negative um, kind of in more modern uh, workflows um, because it means you have to have an audio interface, USB audio interface, if you want to record into a DAW or into a computer, um, and most people do. And so um, it's just yet another piece of hardware that you have to buy, um, yet another, you know, power cable to manage and more cabling and just, you know, it makes the whole setup less portable. Um, so audio over USB is great. Now, that said, there's a lot of synths that do audio U over USB, but kind of do it poorly where they have ground loop issues because the power is also coming over USB and there's other things. So it's like, it's not a perfect system. There's synths that are messing it up. But for the most part, it's definitely something you want. And I don't know if it's possible that maybe that could be added in future firmware. I don't know. Uh, there hasn't been new firmware on this in quite a while. And given the amount of new synths that Korg has put out in the past year, uh, I'm not terribly hopeful that we're going to see a lot of firmware updates on the Minilog XD. I kind of feel like they've moved on from that. I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong there. But, um, but we'll see. Um, yeah, and likewise, I mean, gosh, for the NTS-1, if it had audio over USB, that would be, that would be pretty great, too. So I will say, if you are thinking about the Minilog XD as your only hardware synth, it's like you want to um, work with a DAW, uh, you know, Ableton or whatever you want to use on a computer, and you want to have a single piece of hardware uh, to pair with it, um, it's okay for that. Um, and it's, it's pretty good for that. Um, if you also then have like an audio interface that you like. So it's like, if you kind of are already set up with a computer, a DAW and an audio interface, and you just want to buy one more thing, the mini log XD will fit in very cleanly and nicely to that. And you can use your DAW to sequence it over USB. And that's going to work much better than the internal sequencer. And so if that type of setup, like a fairly minimalist setup appeals to you, I think, you basically, you just you want uh, most of your music creation to be within the box in the DAW, and you just want to have like nice, fat, solid, dependable analog sounds with some cool digital craziness and cool effects coming from the XD. Great. That's I think that's that's like kind of the ideal use case for this synth. Um, and again, if you're okay with the four voice limitation, because I don't really recommend the eight voice polychain. So. Um, and this, you know, I would say, like, in terms of that setup of having your computer keyboard and then this kind of long horizontal thing between you and your monitor, it makes a lot of sense. It, like, it's a good physical setup too, right? Um, so I think I think that's really what this is uh, designed for. Well, I don't know if it's designed for, but like that's I think what I would recommend as its primary use case. Um, now the way I use it, having this on a table with a bunch of other hardware synths. I don't use a computer, I don't use a DAW. Um, I'm doing everything kind of within hardware sequencers. And then I'm typically just recording stereo outputs. I'm not even recording like individual stemmed outputs. Um, in that kind of setup, the Mini Log XD is more challenging to use. It's not as, not as good uh, for a couple reasons. One, again, I, I enjoy kind of the luxurious interface, but it's not very compact. It takes up a lot of space for it not being able to do quite as much. So like, for example, um, I'm using the Electron Dig Digitone now as one of my primary synths. 
that's an eight voice FM synth that's like this big. It's so much smaller and yet it can do way more. And it's kind of taught me that like one knob per function is great um, as you're getting started, but as you kind of progress and know what you want, having a really clever UI like the Digitone has um, is, is kind of better. Um, and it's, it's more compact. I can fit more stuff in there. And uh, I'm finding that I'm starting to value over time synths that have a very uh, compact and well thought out interface. The other one that I just got recently, which I haven't really played with yet, um, is the Dreadbox Typhon. And that's another excellent example of a super compact synth. It's analog, um, it's monophonic. Well, it can do some paraphonic things. It has two oscillators, but, um, but uh, it's, it's very compact, very well thought out UI. It does do audio over USB. Um, like it's, they, it's really, they really thought through how a musician's going to use this uh, in context of a larger setup. And so I think there's synths like that that are um, kind of compact, well thought out, really well supported. Uh, like that one's already on version firmware four, you know, after well, like a year, year and a half, like it's pretty amazing. Um, so there's things like that that I think I would maybe recommend more if you're into uh, kind of the purely hardware dollis uh, realm. Um, the Mini Log XD certainly can be used in that realm, but it's just not quite as well suited for it because of these various things. No MIDI through, um, you know, no uh, uh, no second LFO, the limited onboard sequencer. I mean, there's there's ways, like, I'm still using it, but I can see all the ways in which it's just not as well catered uh, as maybe some other synth. So that's kind of gotten me, like, to this point where, like, I'm now um, I'm now deep enough into kind of my use of this that like it's dependable. I know how to turn it on and um, and start making a sound that I want. Oh, <laughs> that's another big downside that I forgot to mention. Um, every time you turn this synth on, it loads patch slot number one zero zero one, um, and that's a problem it really should load whatever is the last patch slot you used uh, because it means you could go through this big long sound design session. You could spend two hours creating some custom patch, custom sound design, and if you forget to save um, or you, you know, it loses power for whatever reason, like it's gone. You have to, you have to manually save. Um, and that's really frustrating. Like seeing how it works on the electron boxes, Every time you turn it on, you're just right where you left off. Uh, even if you forgot to save, as long as you didn't switch to another pattern, it actually kind of stores all that stuff for you in this like temporary uh, sense. But um, it's really great. Again, if you just accidentally turn it off or accidentally lose power for whatever reason, or just like turn it off and you're like, oh crap, I forgot to save. Electron's got your back. Korg does not have your back, <laughs> unfortunately. Every time you turn it off, Whatever you're doing is gone unless you saved it. And every time you turn it on, you're back to slot number one. And the only way to navigate the 500 different preset slots is to, you know, roll this, this rotary encoder. And I mean, I'm to the point now where like I started, uh, I st started working backwards where like slot 500 was the first patch I made, then 499, 498, et cetera. So I'm counting down like that. And I've now made enough patches that I'm down into like, I think I'm in the, the high 200s or the low 300s, somewhere around there. So in order for me to like get back to whatever I was working on yesterday, I turn it on, I scroll this wheel for like a minute <laughs> to scroll back down to wherever I was. And they'd be like, oh yeah, that's where I was. And then go from there. It's, um, it, I don't understand. It's, it's frustrating. It's, um, again, it's just kind of bad UI. Um, I want to be able to just turn it on and be launched right back into where I was. So that's another thing. I mean, you can set your like little favorites presets that you can quickly jump to. Okay, that's great. Um, but still, I'd rather it just do exactly what it did the last time I was using it. So I do wanna say a really positive thing about the load panel function. And what that means, uh, it's shift right, I think. And what that means is that um, if you scroll to some new preset or some new patch and 
it's making a sound and you don't know what it's doing. Uh, if you do load panel, it will set every, every knob that's on the face here, whatever parameter it's set to, um, it will load that. So it's actually a really good uh, kind of getting started sound design uh, method, I think, is scroll to whatever preset or patch you want and then do load panel with these in kind of all random arrangements. And you're gonna now get a mix of everything that you see on the panel is what you get, but all of the kind of deeper stuff that's maybe hidden away in menus is still there as it was in that preset or patch. So you can get into like these more um, complex presets or patches and kind of keep all of that backend stuff that's like maybe harder to see, um, all the more complex modulations and stuff. Um, but then all the simple stuff is right here on your, on your front panel and you can tweak from there. So I think that's a really positive thing. The load panel function, I use it all the time. It's great. The little built-in oscilloscope screen, absolutely love it. And I think that's, it's, um, I wish more synths had that. And it's something that, like in terms of um, learning, you know, when you turn this knob, what's it doing? It's, it's definitely helpful. And um, over time, I think I look at it less and less, but I, I still appreciate that it's there. Um, overall, the quality of the screen is really good. The, the build quality is really good. The knobs all feel good. Um, there's a lot of positive things to say about this. Um, <laughs> oh, another minor little aesthetic thing. I really love the wood on the back of this. I think it looks great. But as you play the synth, you never get to see it because it's faced away from you. Um, and on the keys version, yeah, basically you never see it. On the module version, though, it's got some wood on the front, too. So you actually do get to see it <laughs> while, while you're playing it, which I appreciate. That's a pretty minor little point, but... Um, but I like seeing the wood that's there. If this is something you're thinking about buying, if you are interested in working uh, primarily with a, a DAW and a computer as your main source of uh, MIDI sequencing and your main source of arrangement, and you kind of want to just record little audio clips and then layer those clips, you know, maybe like you're gonna use this one patch to be your bass and then this other patch to be your lead and this other one to do chord progressions or whatever, the MIDI Log XT is great for that. Um, so that, that's a, a workflow where you're doing, um, you, you know, you're recording something and then you're changing things on the synth to make it sound different and then you're recording another section and then you're layering those on top of each other in your DAW. Um, this synth works beautifully for that. And you can make all sorts of incredible music using only the sounds that this synth can make. Um, it can make uh, obviously synth sounds, but it can also make percussion sounds. Like you can use it to make your kick drums and snare sounds and stuff like that. The noise oscillator, digital noise oscillator, great for stuff like snares and hi-hats, you know. So it really can do a lot. And if you're into that kind of very DAW-centric workflow and doing uh, these kind of multi-take recordings and then layering them later, um, this is an excellent, excellent synth for that. If instead you are more into a DAW-less workflow um, or you just don't want to do the multi-take thing, you want to have a multi-track recording where you're recording a bunch of different stuff simultaneously, um, it definitely can work well for that um, or it cannot. It kind of depends on the context of your setup. In my particular setup, I'm finding it not work terribly well for that. Um, but again, that's, that's going to be unique to the type of thing that I'm trying to do. So I think for my personal journey with this synth, um, I am going to probably sometime in the next couple months uh, give up on the whole eight voice polychain thing. I'm gonna sell. I'm gonna sell the keys version here because, as I've already said, I have I have better keyboards, better MIDI controllers. I prefer the smaller module. This keyboard is just kind of a waste of space for me. So I'm gonna sell this version at some point, um, and I I'm gonna keep this one at least for a while longer. Um, like I said, it's really dependable. If I just want um, kind of just classic analog synth sounds, this just does a very good job at that. Now, um, now that I have another like really nice analog synth, the Dreadbox uh, Typhon, we'll see. We'll see how how much I end up using both of them, um, and uh, maybe I'll I'll make some new decisions in the future. But for now, it's like it's hard for me to imagine giving this up um, because it's what I learned on, and it's just I have a ton of you know hundreds of patches in there that I've created um, that I like and uh, it's just it's a really good one to just sit down and just kind of start getting lost in sound design I say it's, it's a great sound design synth it's not the deepest sound design synth it's not like the best out there but it's it's really solid for what it does and um, I'm really I just I really enjoy it it just sounds very good 
Um, so I can see myself over time kind of growing. I, I, I think it's fair to say I'm outgrowing it. Um, I'd say if, if I were to like graph out my, my um, history with this, it's like when I first got it and it was, it was my only synth, I mean, I just played it all the time. I played it uh, pretty much every day. After a while, I got a little pocket operator as a drum machine to like accompany it. So I'd have just a beat to follow along with. But other than that, you know, I was like, I was just lost in synth heaven uh, for a good long time with this. And then as I started developing more and buying more stuff and dabbling with different things, over time, there was a period where I, it just kind of collected dust. I didn't use it that much because I was exploring new things. And um, the biggest thing I struggled with was that whole... Um, the multi-take recording into a DAW workflow. That just doesn't really jive with me personally, but that's, that's a very, um, uh, very much a personal preference. Um, I found over time that I really prefer the DAW-less workflow because I just don't want to be looking at computers all the time. So um, for me, I, there was a period where I kind of fell out of love with it. Not that I like disliked it, but just that it wasn't working in the workflow I was desiring. And so I just kind of let it sit aside for a while. And now I've kind of cycled back and come back into it and be like, okay, let's just let it do, let the Mini Log XD do what it's good at. Uh, it will be kind of my trusty synth for these particular types of sounds. And then um, I have other gear now that I use for other types of sounds. So in that setup, it's working fine. And I, I don't see myself completely moving on anytime terribly soon. Um, but if you're going to get one thing, <laughs> get the NTS-1. This thing is incredible. I recommend this to absolutely everybody. Uh, it's fantastic. All right, cheers.